Glad to see you all here today on such a snowy, icy day that we just absolutely refused to cancel church on. Well, okay, it wasn't as bad as last week. That might have helped a little bit as well. If you'd like to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. If you have not already done so and you know how to work the Internet, go to our Facebook page or go to our website. And there will be a link there to our YouTube channel where not only am I telling Bible stories on Sunday morning, uh, but I'm telling some supplemental Bible stories, some of the ones that usually fall between the cracks during the week. And last Sunday when we did cancel church, I came here and preached to my wife <laughs> and baby daughter in front of a camera. And uh, it got us out of the house. And then as I went to edit the video and then do the long, arduous process of uploading to YouTube, it didn't make it online till Monday. Uh, but uh, anyways, uh, in the future, when we do miss a service, I'd like to put these Bible stories and things out there. And, and so you can go online and, and do that. We'll just have to do it a little earlier next time. Last week, if you did watch the video, you got to hear some of the stories about Abraham that probably most people don't know. Like the time they went down to Egypt and he lied to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, about how uh, this is not my wife, this is my sister, so please don't kill me so that you can have her. And, uh, and, and also, uh, if we ever get into our heads that Abraham, who is the guy we are talking about, sometimes, sometimes we get into our heads that he is this boring shepherd type of guy and sure he's got enough flocks and herds and servants that other people do his shepherding for him but we fail to understand that out of all the servants he had he had three over 300 trained armed men that whenever invaders came to the city of Sodom and carried off his nephew Lot he took his 318 trained men and they took them by surprise at night and recaptured all of the spoil from those cities. So that story is online if you'd like to hear it. It's also, of course, in Genesis where it's been sitting there for like 5,000 years if you want to read it. But as we come to Abraham, Abraham is so important. He's not the boring figure that I thought he was growing up. He's not the answer to the Bible trivia question, who was Isaac's father or who was the father of the Hebrew race? Abraham is the first person that the Bible really zooms in on and says this it is what it is like to have faith in God. What is it like to have faith in God? I would like to say a few things about this uh, because even in the Bible it seems that there are two New Testament writers who take the story of Abraham very differently. Now they do not take the story of Abraham very differently. They just highlight different facets of his life. Paul in Romans like to hold up, likes to hold up Abraham as the example of someone who first trusted in God and then that was counted as righteousness and that's what Genesis said. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now we all know that if we lived our lives better fewer bad things would happen to us. And I'm not even talking about God looking out for us. I'm talking about the way this world works, right? If we would just say no to that cheesecake, there, I guess what I'm trying to say is if we would do the right thing, there would be fewer consequences, right? Or fewer bad converse, consequences. If I would just put down the Dorito bag after about chips instead of when it's empty, and I mean the family size, y'all. Back when I ate carbs, I did this without even thinking. All right. If I would just, you know, go for a walk every once in a while, if I would just not answer my wife the way I actually, the first thought that pops into my head, if I would just not answer the children with the first thought that pops into my head, if I would just do the right thing instead of the wrong thing, there would be fewer bad consequences. Amen. And life would be better. So righteousness is a good thing. We all have that person that we look up to, that person that we can call in any situation. And they are, we don't use this term, but they are a righteous person. They are a good person. They are that person that I want to be. And so we think that righteousness is all about working, 
doing better, working and, 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 and working better and, and working hard or whatever. And, and there's all kinds of systems of righteousness out there. Uh, here in America, we used to be able to assume that everybody understood what it meant to be kind of a Christian moral sense of righteousness. And so good people, uh, if you were, if you were Southern Baptist or some other evangelical, good people don't drink and smoke and cuss. Or, or good people, uh, go to work every day. Or good people, and, and now, and we have all of these other religious systems out there. We've, we've had to encounter the Islamic world, and they have a, their own system of what it means to be a good person, a righteous person. And some of it overlaps. Some of it's the same as ours. And some of it is very different. And we have the political correctness culture. And if you show up to the State of the Union address not wearing white, <laughs> telling you what to wear, telling you what words you can use. You know, I've read 1985 where they had new speak and, and, and the horrible government controlled the language. And it sounds just like political correctness. People think Christians can be very strict. I'm just glad that my religion is not political correctness. They want to control what you wear, what you eat. That They tell you that vegetarianism is the only righteous way to be. Our country is full of religious people. It's not all the same religion. So what does it mean to be righteous? Paul likes... You didn't think I was going to make it back to the sermon, did you? <laughs> Paul... Paul likes to hold up Abraham and say, you know what? You know what Abraham had first? Abraham had faith. And God counted his faith as righteousness. Amen? Amen. Abraham had faith. Abraham was one of the children of God before it made him a good person. We don't, we don't work and we don't try and we don't, and we don't just keep trying to do good things and good works and just, oh, if I just try harder, if I just do better, if I just remember to do it right the next time. It's not about that. Abraham has a relationship with God first. And I hope that the previous talks about Abraham have gotten that through to you. Abraham was a, a guy with a pagan background and, and he married his half-sister and there's all kind of just weirdness going on and he's a good guy in some ways. He stays with his wife of his youth even though she doesn't produce children. But he's got some other weird things going on. Lying to Pharaoh, telling everybody, oh, this is my sister, you know, and sure, you can have her and marry her off. That's great, you know. Oh, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. That is actually my wife. I did just trick you into committing adultery or whatever. You know, nasty, terrible, you know, Abraham's not perfect. But he had that relationship with God. And he was, one of, he was God's chosen man to be his representative on the earth to show the nations to reveal for God to reveal himself to the nations. James, on the other hand, likes to point out that Abraham acted in faith. Abraham didn't just say, I believe. When God commands him, this is what we're going to talk about today, the, the covenants and the child of promise, God uh, Abraham had an active faith. When God says you and every male in your household needs to be circumcised if they are eight days old or older, Abraham goes home and does it. And then later when Isaac is born, he is circumcised on the eighth day. James uses all this to illustrate that, without, uh, that faith without works is dead. It's not a real faith. So we want to emulate the faith of Abraham the first one of God's people. And yeah, there were people before this. There was Shem. There was Seth. There was Enoch. There was, uh, you know, there was, there, was, there was a holy line before this. There's probably some of those people before Abraham that we will see in heaven. But Abraham is that example of what it means to come from a fallen world and to be saved by God. Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 8. Hebrews 11, 8 through 12, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power 
to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you for your love and your kindness, and I just pray that your hand would be upon us as we learn from Father Abraham. Lord, I pray that we would feel his legacy today, and that if anyone here is not one of your children, is not a part of your family, O oh Lord, that we would consent to being children of Abraham, children of you. Jesus, we thank you for dying on the cross to save us. Holy Spirit, guide us into all knowledge. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we often try to explain salvation uh, and, and, and we, we water it down. We, we don't water it down. I'm sorry, that was the wrong phrase. Uh, we like to distill it down. This is the only thing Baptists distill, okay? Uh, the, we like to distill it down to its main parts because we are Americans. Get to the point. And this has worked well for us. If we can share four spiritual laws or we can have that conversation that says, you know, these are the points of the gospel, you know, uh, and they often go something like this. Man is sinful. God created the world perfect, but man is sinful. And so that means all of mankind is sinful. That means you're sinful. That means I'm sinful. And someone had to die for that sin. So Jesus came and he died for that sin. And so if you want to believe on Jesus, he takes your sin and you get his righteousness and stuff. And, and of course, it's very New Testament focused. And something that probably has not helped is a theology called dispensationalism. And it's very popular in evangelical circles. And, and, and I probably just made somebody mad right here in this room. Uh, that's okay. That's kind of my job. But uh, we, no, oh, didn't get any laughs on that. That's always a scary. <laughs> that's always scary when you're like, well, I probably just, you know, made you mad, whatever, and no laughs. Um, yep, you did. Uh, but, but, and, and I'm not going to throw out everything that you've ever heard any dispensationalist ever say. I'm just going to say that uh, there's kind of been a teaching out there or an understanding, and sometimes we teach it right and people take it wrong or vice versa, that the Old Testament is done with and the New Testament is something completely different. We need to get that out of our heads right now. We need to learn to love the Bible. That's why I'm telling Bible stories. We need to learn to love the Bible and, and love the whole thing. You know, and it's not as intimidating as all this. This has a whole bunch of commentary, all right? This looks like something you could beat a mule to death with, all right? Uh, but you can get the thin lines. You know, you can, you can read a lot of books of the Bible in just one sitting. It doesn't have to be that intimidating. And we need to learn to love the whole thing. And, and I guess what I'm really trying to say is Abraham got saved the same way we do. And there are people out there who are going to relate to Abraham, the family man, relate to Abraham, uh, the, the man who trusted in the Lord, relate to all of those things. And, and maybe the, the standard man is sinful and Jesus died for our sins. Maybe that, uh, maybe that proposition, maybe that presentation is not necessarily going to reach that person, but they see someone like Abraham trusting in the Lord and maybe it will uh, mean something to them that our standard way of sharing the gospel doesn't. Abraham, we're going to talk today about probably the stories that everybody knows about Abraham. Abraham had a covenant with God. In fact, God visited Abraham several times and he would further perfect that covenant. He would explain more in that covenant. When, when he meets Abraham at 75 years old, that's Abraham, not God. When Abraham is 75 years old, God comes to him and he says, now that your dad has died, I've got a plan for you. I want you to get up. I want you to move away from your relatives. And, 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 if, and if Abraham said, where are we going, God? He said, I'll show you. Which is not very comforting when you've got a whole lot to move and your wife is asking you, so where is it that God said that we're moving to? Uh, but but uh, God visits Abraham several more times. In, for example, in that first uh, meeting with Abraham, God told him, you will be a father of many nations. Now, is that figurative? Is that, you know, he's already 75 and hasn't been able to have children yet. 
Uh, but as God continues to appear to Abraham, it be, God gives him more and more and more details. And that's where our story begins. As God visits him for a second time, he tells him, you will have a son. Now, what is problematic with this is that Abraham's wife, Sarah, still going by the name of Sarai, Abram and Sarai at this point. Sarai says, God said that Abraham will have a son. I'm going to help him with this because apparently I cannot have children. So she offers up something that was considered fairly normal back then, unfortunately. She offers up her maidservant, her female servant, and says, perhaps she will bear children for me. And she's an Egyptian, uh, a slave girl that they had acquired in Egypt. And uh, if you'll remember, Eve is deceived with the fruit and Adam just goes along with it. And in this case, here comes Sarai saying, take my servant girl Hagar and have children by her. And unfortunately, Abram just goes along with it. He's like his father, Adam. He doesn't stand up for what is right. He says, okay, honey. And he just goes along with it. And they have a son named Ishmael. And after this happens, Hagar, the servant girl, is queen mother. Now, maybe not officially, but there's something in the human heart that says, I'm the one that has his children, therefore I'm really his wife. And Hagar begins to not necessarily listen to Sarah when she gives her an order anymore. And she honors herself as being the mother of Ishmael. And she starts to treat her mistress Sarai in a poor fashion. And this causes conflict. You know, uh, Every once in a while, the question of polygamy comes up. And it is one of those odd questions because in the New Testament, we have a lot of prohibitions against it, but not as many as you would think. And then you get to the Old Testament, and these guys married about as many women as they possibly could, and God never strikes them with lightning or anything like that. He never just comes down and says, No! Now, apparently, in Africa and other places, Christians really have to deal with these questions like polygamy is everywhere in some cultures. And now that we have encountered the Islamic world more so than we used to, I used to not be able to spell Iraq when I was a kid. Actually, you can. It's only four letters. But you know what I mean. We didn't know where either of those, any of those places were. And then after 9-11, all of a sudden, we've encountered this Muslim world that we'd ignored for so long. And not only do the men there like the polygamy, but there's a lot of... They, they, they're always putting some woman in a hijab on the camera saying, you don't understand. Islam is very respectful towards women. And, they, and it's like, you don't look respected. Of course, it's not our culture. And you got all these complicated questions. And so the question's going to come up. Is polygamy really wrong? Is that something that Christians decided? Uh, is, is it something we can practice if we want to? Here's what the Old Testament tells us about polygamy. Number one, God made one man and one woman in the Garden of Eden. And, and anytime they ask Jesus, what about divorce? What about all these other things? What about anything related to marriage? Jesus always points back to creation. God made one man and one woman in the Garden of Eden. And that answers all of our questions. It's amazing how many questions that one story answers. But then you do have the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, King David, King Solomon. Poor guy. You'll write Ecclesiastes too after you've had 700 wives. Oh my goodness. And, and, and uh, it's, it's very dark. If you haven't read Ecclesiastes, this can be pretty dark. What we find is because these men are taking care of, paying for the needs of, taking care of, not throwing these women out on the street, God's not going to strike them with lightning. And if you ever find yourself in some kind of missionary situation where some guy is taking care of all of his wives, guess what? Who knows what would, in many situations, who knows what would be happening to those women if they were not 
married to that guy. Sometimes it could be worse, and God understands that. But at the same time, nothing good ever comes from this. And we see that in example after example after example. Two women living under the same roof. They fight. They bicker. They, they, they are jealous of each other over the affections of their husband. This happens every time. It happens with Abraham. It happens with Jacob. It happens with David. It happens with Solomon. It happens with all of them. There is no good example of a polygamy situation in the Bible. And then in the New Testament, we find that if you want to be in the ministry, if you want to be someone that the rest of the church is supposed to look up to, you're supposed to be the husband of only one wife as a deacon or a pastor. And that's not just a rule for a deacon or a pastor. That is something all men should aspire to. If you got saved after you already had five wives, well, guess what? You don't kick them out on the street. But you need to understand, this is the Christian ideal. This is what God intended, not just from the New Testament, but from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, one man and one woman. Now, does it sometimes get more complicated than that? Yeah. But Abram should have rejected this idea. They have a son named Ishmael, and God shows up. To make a long story short, God shows up later and says, that's not what I meant. You, 80-something-year-old Abraham, will have a child, a miracle child, with your elderly wife. And he, and he gives them a sign of, of circumcision. You will go home. You will be circumcised. Your, all, the, all the men, even your male slaves, all, every male in your household, you're all going to be circumcised. Once they hit day eight of their life, if they are eight days old or older, the men will be circumcised. And there's another time that God visits and, and says, you know, your wife will have a son and she's eavesdropping and she laughs. She laughs at this idea because she's so old. And so then God commands that the son that they will have will be named Isaac, which means laughter. And sure enough, uh, when, a, uh, when Abraham was about 100 and she was about 90, she conceived and gave birth to a son that they named Isaac. He was the child of promise. And I've said it before. Not only did God choose the nation of Israel, God created the nation of Israel. Sure, he created everything back at creation. But, but like the author of Hebrews said, Abraham was as good as dead. He was pushing a hundred, hadn't had any children yet. And God says, I'm going to choose you. And you are going to be the father of many nations and the special nation that the Messiah will come from. And sure enough, in his old age, in their old age, Abraham and Sarah have Isaac. I don't know if you've ever known somebody who has a child later in life. That kid is often spoiled. Just saying. Just saying. One of them was my mother. Just saying. And, and, and when you pile onto a kid all of that anticipation, we couldn't have children, we couldn't have children, we couldn't have children, finally we had one child. And sometimes you put all of that, you know, we are just so happy to have this one child. One day, and of course I reread all of these stories. I, I know these stories really well, but you got to reread them before you tell them. Make sure you're going to get all the details right. I was struck by God's conversation with Abraham. You know, God likes to talk to Abraham in these long, poetic passages about, oh, your children will number like the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. But um, after God talks to him and gives him the sign of circumcision, another, and after uh, God visits him, and tells him Isaac will be born and I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and all that stuff happens and that'll be a separate story. Abraham speaks to God and he says, you will offer up your son Isaac as a sacrifice. Short and to the point. Now, of course, theologically at this point, Abraham's got to be a bit curious. You know, he's God has promised that I am going to be the father of many nations and he gave me a son to prove it. And it's going to happen through Isaac. So what? And now I'm supposed to kill the child. 
And that is just the theological dilemma. What about all the emotional dilemma? We waited for this one child. And I don't even want to kill anybody. We don't practice human sacrifice. What is going on? You know, uh, there's actually a lot of sects of Judaism that teach that Abraham misunderstood God. Because the Hebrew word for sacrifice and the Hebrew word for elevated are very similar. So we get it, reading it thousands of years later with no vowels. But Abraham, who was standing there at the time, misheard God. <laughs> and as he offers up Isaac, God comes running in. No, don't do it. That's not what I meant. I remember a woman had written a poem about Abraham and Isaac walking shamefully down from the mountain. Sarah's outside the tent. What happened? And they had to own up to the idea that Abraham was this stupid. Now, in case you haven't figured it out yet, this is not how we tell the story. This is not how we understand the story. And this is not how the Bible tells the story. God dropped all kinds of emotional nastiness on Abraham when he just shows up and said, this son, whom you love. Love is not a word the Bible throws around a whole lot uh, in these serious passages. The son whom you love, the next time you do a sacrifice, I want it to be him. What are you willing to give? You know, we just skip to the end of that conversation. Well, what I cherish the absolute most is my children. I mean, that's kind of the whole thing, right? I mean, we, we run the rat race, we go to work, we pick up the paycheck, we do a job we don't like, or maybe a job we like a little bit, or even the dream job that we thought we had turned out to be a job anyways, and we do it, and we come home, and we don't get much sleep because of the kids, and we, we, we do all of this because you're supposed to have a wife, a house, and kids, and kids, that's the point. Kids are the point, Right? God says, if I ask for your kids, you be willing to give them up. You know, I think this will blow the mind of a lot of church folks. Because I, I have a lot of friends in ministry and they're at some big church somewhere and their big youth group is going to take a big mission trip somewhere that, you know, it, it never seems safe. It never seems safe, you know. What are you going to, how are you going to guarantee my kids this? Guarantee my kids that? How are you going to, you know, what, what is all this? And, and no, my kids can't go. And that sounds dangerous. My kid being up on a roof. My kid doing this and that and other things. And my kid uh, witnessing to those people. And my kid knocking on doors in that neighborhood and everything. And God shows up to Abraham and says, sacrificing. We're not talking something risky. We're talking a done deal. Kid's going to die. And I'm asking for you to give him up. And Abraham doesn't argue. He just does what the Lord tells him to. It's amazing, right? No wonder Abraham gets like the medal of honor in the Bible for faith, right? And, and you know, he, he still had that theological question in the back of his mind. You know, God promised I was going to be father of many nations through Isaac somehow, so maybe God will raise him from the dead. I don't know. But Abraham trusted God. And they went up on that mountainside. And and I don't know if... if uh, I remember having a cartoon that I watched as a kid where Isaac's like, well, if that's what God asked for, then I'm ready, Father. You know, and it's just like, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, he's like... And, and Isaac asks on the way up the mountain, you know, we got wood, we got tinder, where's the lamb? And Abraham very wisely answers, oh, the Lord will provide. They get up there and so we imagine Abraham tackling Isaac and getting him tied up and put on that altar. The Bible says he pulled out the knife and he was ready to do it. The angel of the Lord stopped him. He sees 
And God says, see now, I see that you would not even withhold your son from me, your most cherished possession. I see now that I have you because you're willing to give up all of your cherished possessions for me. And that's the challenge. That's the challenge is to have faith like Abraham. So I'm totally planning on this building being empty next Sunday. I mean, that is, that is the weight of what I'm trying to get across to you guys, all right? Now, this, this is impossible, right? I want to go back to something I was trying to introduce at the beginning of the sermon. Abraham is obedient. That doesn't mean he did everything right. It means that he was in a state of obedience. I believe obedience is a state. You, we, we talk about <clears throat> being a child of God in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, there's a lot of obedience. Do this, don't do that, uh, all of this stuff. You must do all of the things just right, or at least that's how it sounds. But really, if you really read the story of Abraham for what it's worth and, and take it at face value, Abraham's not perfect. He's obedient. Obedience is a state. And we are so convinced that we could be obedient if we would just keep doing more obedient things. If I would just do this thing, if I would just do that thing, if I would just show up for church more often, if I would just give more in the offering plate, if I would just do all this stuff. And, and I'm going to tell you something that's a little counterintuitive. All of these acts of obedience, unfortunately, do not add up to obedience. That's what the Bible is trying to tell us. Doing does not add up to being. Righteous acts do not add up to righteousness. And if you are relying on righteous acts to add up to righteousness, guess what? You've always forgotten something. You've always failed at something. If you go, look, look, here, I've got this act, and I've done this, and I've, and I've helped with that, and I donated to that fund, and I helped out with that, and somebody came by, and oh, oh, that's what you're relying on. Well, what about all the times you didn't? Uh-oh. I built a scaffolding, but it didn't stand. God offers us a state of obedience, a state of being in obedience. And Abraham, for all of his faults, had signed up to be on God's team. And God himself had made it possible for Abraham to do that. And so Abraham did not really get saved or become one of God's people in any totally different fashion than we do today. God offers you a state of obedience. And you're not going to do everything right. You're not going to do everything right. But that's okay because if, if you took all your righteous acts and brought them before God, there would be, He would be able to poke all kinds of holes in it. He would be able to poke all kinds of holes in it. No one could live up to that. But that state of obedience that was paid for by Jesus Oh, sure, by the time of Abraham, Jesus has not yet come along and paid the price on the cross. But he's going to. And when God says he is going to do something, he is going to do it. It's not like when Pastor Travis says he's going to do something, okay? Pastor Travis has just about given up on that, and he tells you that what he's going to do is to forget to do that thing, okay? That's the word you can trust from Pastor Travis, all right? If you don't see him get out his phone and punch some buttons and do something like, then it's going to get forgotten. It just is. But when God says he is going to do something, God can count the sacrifice of Jesus because as far as God is concerned, it might as well have already happened. Everyone who becomes a child of God, whether they lived before Jesus or if they live in our age after Jesus, if they have faith in God, they can be in a state of obedience. They can exist. It will be a, a function of their being and not necessarily of their doing. And that's what we want to ask you this morning. Are you ready to be one of the children of God? Or are you going to continue to 
try to be more godlike? Are you ready to let God take over? Now, there of course is faith and there is acts. He had the faith, but he also did the acts. He brought Isaac up on that mountainside. He circumcised every male member of his household. Circumcised Ishmael. Circumcised Isaac when he was eight days old. So whenever you say you have a faith and you aren't proving it by how you live your life, yeah, your fellow church members and your pastor are going to go, uh, you know, you, we need to work on something. Something is not right here. But I don't want you to miss the point that all the things that you do are never going to add up to you being a Christian. They're never going to add you up to you being one of the children of God. They're never going to add up to you being one of the people of God like Abraham. Abraham believed God and he credited it to him as righteousness. And that's what we want you to do. We want you to believe God. How do I get saved? You don't. God saves you. God saves you. Is that something you would be upset about? Because then God would change, God would rule over your life. God would rule over your life. He might ask for your only child. Your only child's gonna grow up, be a missionary to some faraway place, but they're gonna die after only six months. Well, when I told you you could have my life, God, I didn't mean you could do that. You're gonna be out of work for a year. You're going to squeeze through finally, but it's going to get close. Wouldn't it be great if God warned you that kind of stuff? Wouldn't that be great? So if God has you in the palm of His hand when He warns you about it, what about when He doesn't? And you're going through a time like that. And if you knew the end of the story, you'd feel a little bit better, but you don't know the end of the story. Let's be the people of God and not just try to act like the people of God. Abraham believed God. It was counted to him as righteousness. God chose Abraham. God gave Abraham a son that he did not have before. That son grew into a great nation. The nation that told the world all about the Ten Commandments, the laws of God, to be good to your slaves, to be good to your wives, to uh, and, and, and that's a study all in of itself. But even they failed God, but that's okay because God Himself was born into that nation and made the ultimate sacrifice on the cross. And as we're contemplating the fact that Abraham did not withhold his own son, but God saved Abraham's son, I want to remind you that God did not withhold His own son. And no one stepped in to save God's Son. And God was willing to sacrifice His own Son. We were watching last night the movie that we showed. Uh, many, many times we hear these stories of Christians who grow up in one context. They have a fairly decent life. You know, the, the whole point of life is job, wife, kids, that kind of thing. And then... They get slammed with something that was never in their world before. Maybe they go somewhere like fighting in a foreign country. And they, the Christianity that they had learned doesn't seem to have answers for that. Or maybe something happens to them here. And they have to fight cancer or something. And this God that they thought was going to make their life comfortable, the Christianity that they had learned doesn't seem to have the answers for that kind of situation. Or something that's a little less intense than cancer and dying or foreign wars. You know, you get up, you, you grow up, you, you meet the spouse and you're intending to have that Christian relationship, but terrible things happen in that marriage. And you're left wondering where was God and all that. The Christianity that you learned didn't seem to have the answers for how life looked. What I appreciated last night was even in the foxhole, 
even in the counterinsurgency and all of that. Maybe that chaplain went into it. Maybe the Christianity he already had didn't have answers for it, but the God of the Bible did. And Abraham lived in that world full of polygamy, full of highway bandits. I mean, he's a shepherd with a whole bunch of flocks and he's got over 300 armed men for a reason. It's dangerous to be a nomad out there with all those sheep, flocks, cattle, and, and I don't know, maybe a camel or two or something. But We wonder why doesn't God make our life easier? And it doesn't sound like much comfort until you really think about it deeply. God is willing to live with us in the destructive world that we live in. He didn't come down in a fiery chariot and rescue all of those army men out of that the movie based on a true story that we saw last night. But he lives, he lives in that world. Uh, we, we, we have this bloody picture in the Old Testament, all these sheep and goats and bulls just being sacrificed all day at the tabernacle and later, later the temple. And why does God want us to do something so bloody in his religion? And, and why does God want Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? And then we get to the New Testament and God sacrifices his own son. And some of us are left scratching our heads going, this still does not sound like a good God. But I just want to leave you with that thought. God is willing to live in the nasty, blood-soaked, real world. And sometimes here in America, we don't live in the real world. We are unwilling to live in the real world. We hear about tragedies happening in other places. And you know what? It, all, it eventually becomes white noise sometimes, doesn't it? We used to talk about first world problems, you know. You get up on the wrong side of the bed and stub your toe. And, and uh, sure, there's people in other places starving, but I'm having a really bad day, you know. First world problem. So we ignore what life is really like. We've built a better place for ourselves here. God doesn't do that. God doesn't stay in his heaven enjoying himself, looking down at earth and going, well... It's a mess, but they made it themselves. No, he doesn't do that. He is willing to live in the world of sacrifice, of blood, of tears, of injury, and death. And he accompanies us through this life. He's not too good to get his hands dirty. He's not, uh, and he's certainly not afraid of what the enemy can throw at us. He proves all of that in the Bible. And He wants to walk with you. We don't want you to do anything to get saved except just surrender. Give up. Quit trying to run your own life. Quit trying to tell God what it is He ought to be doing with the world and say, whatever it is, God, that you want me to do, whatever it is you want me to think, whatever it is, if I find it in the Bible, I might have questions, but I'm not going to argue with you anymore. I turn my life over to you. Even without knowing the name of Jesus, Abraham did it. Because it's God that does all the work. 